And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. One thing I've learned about living out in the country, as we do, relatively speaking, is that you see plenty of critters. We hear the howl of coyotes sometimes at night and certainly have had our share of squirrels and chipmunks and other assorted animals traipsing around. Thankfully so far not a skunk, although we have seen them in other areas. One thing you kind of have to get used to, in addition to that, are the bugs. Now, I've lived in situations where you have bugs in an apartment or some such, but usually you call an exterminator and they come over and take care of the problem. Here, there is no taking care of the problem. The bugs are just there and they're not going anywhere. As a matter of fact, they probably view us as the interlopers and wonder when we're going to vacate the premises and let them have it. One interesting thing I'm sure you have seen for yourself is when you get up in the middle of the night, whether to go to the bathroom or it's pitch dark or to go get a drink of water or whatever, you stumble into the kitchen and turn on the light, and if there are bugs there, you see them scatter. You see them run. I have seen some disgusting bugs run for cover when I've done that. Long, spindly, multi-legged, hairy things, usually coming up from the drain or what have you, and there's a good reason they're running, because they know if I catch them, that's going to be it. That's going to be the end. They prefer to come out under the cover of darkness when they think no one's looking to do whatever it is they're doing, probably foraging for food. And the light then bothers them because it exposes them to much larger and angrier creatures such as myself. And like I said, I'm sure you've had this happen around your house. We are talking about darkness and light on this first Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of hope. But we're going to think about this theme of darkness and light, especially in the context of our readings, and most especially regarding our reading from Romans chapter 13. I call your attention to Romans 13, verse 12, where it says, The night is far gone and the day is near. Therefore, lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. And that's what we want to think about as we start Advent. This idea of the armor of light, what we're calling the armor of Advent, as we get ready to move into our Christmas season. I'm sure you're fully aware of the concept of armor. When I mention that term, or when you think of that term that pops into your head, you may think of medieval knights, whether that's the chainmail armor or the actual suits of armor that the knights wore. And even in a modern day sense, we still have armor to protect us. Our vehicles, at least those that carry important things such as vast sums of money, are armor-plated. And police certainly wear armor-type 
protective gear to keep themselves safe uh, from attack. So as you think about armor and as we think about armor, we want to think about some of the obvious things that armor does or at least is supposed to do. And the first and most obvious thing is the idea of protection. First and foremost, armor is supposed to protect, whether it was to protect the knights of medieval times or to protect vehicles and policemen of today. There is an element, a basic element, no matter what form or type of armor we're talking about, of protection. And biblically, we see that as well. Most obviously, in Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul talks about putting on the full armor of God for protection, which includes the shield of faith, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, among other things. Just consider that shield, for example, in Ephesians 6.16. That is a protective piece meant to protect us, as it specifically says in that verse, from the fiery darts or fiery arrows of the evil one. So most of the armor Paul is talking about, spiritual armor that we put on, is designed for protection, to protect us, just as real armor does. Our spiritual armor is designed to protect us. And I encourage you, by the way, every day to pray that, to go to God and to put on your spiritual armor as you start the day. The helmet of salvation the belt of truth, the shoes of peace, the breastplate of righteousness. And one thing we haven't mentioned so far, and that's the sword of the Spirit. So just as armor is supposed to be protective, in some cases, armor can be an offensive weapon as well. You've all seen the movies with the ancient knights in them whether they had a lance for jousting or a mace to swing at their opponents. The mace, remember, is that spiked ball of metal at the end of a chain that could be swung around. Sometimes armor is not just protective, but it's offensive as well. And that's the point of the sword of the Spirit that Paul mentions in Ephesians 6.17. The sword of the Spirit, he says, is the Word of God. And that's an offensive weapon. Just as the shield of faith protects us from the fiery darts of the evil one, we can use the sword of the Spirit as an offensive weapon against Satan. And we see this demonstrated quite vividly in Jesus' temptations in the desert. When Satan comes to him and tempts him in three different ways. And what does Jesus say in each instance or situation? It is written. When Satan comes to him and says, You've got to be famished, Jesus. You've been out here for 40 days without anything to eat. Command these stones to turn into bread so you won't be hungry. Jesus tells him, it is written, you shall not live by bread alone. He is using the word of God as an offensive weapon against Satan to turn aside Satan's attacks. And we can do that as well. When Satan comes to you, accusing you, challenging you, tempting you 
whispering in your ear, that's when you need to pull out the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and use it as an offensive weapon. Satan, get behind me, for it is written. And this is why it's so important for us to know what the Word of God is. So that when we are tempted, when we are attacked by Satan, we can go to God's Word, the sword of the Spirit, and use it as an offensive weapon against him. So armor in that sense, as we are thinking about it in Ephesians 6, can be a protective device, but it also can be an offensive weapon. But we're thinking about armor also in a third way this morning, and that goes back to our reading. And that is armor as a covering. Armor, the medieval type of armor, was designed to cover the entire body, especially the vulnerable parts, where arrows or lances or maces or what have you were most likely to strike and where it would hurt the most. And so we're thinking about armor as a covering, something we put on. And in the same way, with our faith, we are told to put on the armor of light. This goes back to Psalm 104. If you look at Psalm 104, 104 verse 2, we read, The Lord wraps himself in light as a garment. And we too can put on that garment, just as God does in Psalm 104, we can put on that garment of light, which is what is being referred to in our reading from Romans 13. We put on that light to protect ourselves from the darkness. So what is the light and what is the darkness? What are we protecting ourselves from? Well, I think that's somewhat obvious. The darkness is evil in the world. It is sin. It is everything that Satan represents in trying to pull us away from God. It is everything corruptible of our fleshly selves. That is the darkness. And just like those bugs we talked about, People prefer doing their sinful deeds at night under the cover of darkness when they think no one is looking. Paul writes in Ephesians 5.11, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. In other words, expose them how? Expose them to the light. Shine the light on them. Expose them so that they can be seen for what they are. The darkness then is the sinful, evil deeds that Satan constantly tempts us to that are contrary to the word and will of God. How do we overcome the darkness? By putting on the armor of light. And that light is Jesus Christ. He is the light that we are to put on in contrast to the darkness. Jesus called himself the light. In John 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me never walks in the darkness, but has the light of life in him. So you see the contrast here quite clearly. There is darkness, sin, and death. But what overcomes that is the light of Christ, which leads to life. And we can put on that light 
just as we put on a garment of clothes to protect ourselves from evil and sin and Satan and death. We've called this the armor of Advent. What does this have to do with Advent? Advent is about the coming of the light. The light is coming. Jesus will soon be here. And have you put on that armor of light that is Jesus Christ? Have you clothed yourselves in that light so as to overcome the fleshly, sinful deeds of our human nature? Because that is the only way that those deeds are overcome. That is the only way that our natural, selfish, fleshly inclinations can be defeated is by putting on the armor of light, wearing it like a suit of armor. And that's not something that we take off at night and put in the closet. Don't think of it that way. When you put it on, you put it on to live that way always because Christ enables us to live that way. It is putting on the armor of light that changes us that makes us different, that helps us overcome the sinful nature. The light is coming. Are you ready to put it on as a garment and live with it always? So far I haven't seen any dangerous bugs in our house. I have in other times and other places. And by dangerous, I just mean kind of really, really terrifying. You know the kind of bug I'm talking about? The cockroaches that are like three inches long. And they have that armor plating on them and those antenna that stick out for several inches. And they just look terrifying. They look like small cars, in a way, like minivans, with that plating on them. You know, I've heard it said, and I'm sure you have too, that in the event of a nuclear holocaust, the only thing that will survive, guaranteed, are Twinkies and cockroaches. And cockroaches, well, I can't speak for Twinkies, but cockroaches... That I can believe, in part because they have that armor plating on them. They look so well protected. And it's the armor that gives them that appearance. It's the same way with us in a spiritual sense. Our very spiritual survival depends on whether or not we can put on the armor of Christ. If we can put on the armor of light to overcome the deeds of evil and sin and Satan and death. That is the only thing we can do in a very real sense to guarantee our spiritual survival. As we move through Advent, we get closer to the coming of the light, the light of Christ that will shine in our hearts, but not just for Christmas Day, but for always. That's the wonderful thing about it. It's not just for one day, for always. If we are willing to put on his armor, the armor of light, to overcome the darkness in our lives. One of the verses we hear a lot during Advent is Isaiah 9 2. 
and I think it's extremely appropriate for our discussions this morning. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. Amen.